Okay. okay. So uh, it is a great pleasure again uh, to present uh, Philippe Jayel uh, from the Paris School of Economics. Uh, per, uh, Philippe is a winner of uh, two ERC grants, uh, the former council member of the Game Theory Society and of the Econometric Society. He studies uh, repeated gains, bargaining, auctions, and mechanism design. And today we'll talk about analogy-based expectation equilibrium. So Philippe, zoom in. Hey, thanks very much. Well, let me add, I'm also at UCL, uh, so I don't want to <laughs> my second employer more. <clears throat> so it's, uh, uh, I thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to present that work on the analogy-based expectation equilibrium. It's a kind of survey uh, paper. I started this research uh, agenda like uh, 15 or 20 years ago, uh, so apologies for that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a long... Uh... So the, the general motivation for this is, I suppose, the same as for uh, bounded rationality in general. That is, in complex environments, by which I mean envi environments having many states or many uh, possible histories or many possible private information, let's call that contingency. So in games, we, in situations with many contingencies, uh, the standard solution concept, which assume players understand perfectly well what will happen in every contingency, seems very demanding, right? Instead, I would argue that uh, uh, in real life, we are very often exposed in such complex situations to aggregate statistics, describing aggregate behaviors over clusters of contingencies. And the aim of this uh, solution concept or research agenda uh, is to, well, first objective is to provide a, a game theoretic solution concept, which I call the analogy based expectation equilibrium, uh, that aims to describe the steady state uh, of uh, uh, environments in which players would deliberate based on these aggregate statistics. Okay, so we'll see in the talk what I mean more precisely by, by this concept, but once this concept is in place, uh, the kind of questions um, as an economist or game theorist, I, I don't know how you want to, to call me, probably in this community, uh, economists, uh, uh, would be to see with this new uh, or this solution concept, whether it can explain, explain new phenomena. Can it explain puzzles that, uh, for example, the emergence of bubbles or speculative trade, when we usually would expect the no trade theorem to arise, or can it explain new phenomena like deception by which I mean inducing erroneous beliefs in the mind of others, which of course, with a rational expectation approach is not possible to achieve. So in the rest of the talk, I will try to, because I'm aware the, most of you may not be um, familiar to say the least or even know about this concept. So I will try to provide a, a description of this uh, solution concept uh, for uh, relatively general uh, uh, strategic interactions, uh, mixing multi-stages and private information, then I will uh, try to illustrate, well, I will first provide maybe basic properties of this concept, like existence and how it differs from uh, known concepts like Nash equilibrium, and then I will try to give some slightly more uh, 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 concrete illustrations of this approach with a focus on two new applications, uh, which, is relate which are related to, on the one hand to speculative trades and on the other personal economics. May maybe I will skip one of these two depending on time, we we'll see. And then at the end of the talk, I will uh, discuss quickly uh, related and, and even more quickly less related approaches. And if time permits, I will briefly uh, suggest possible avenues for future research, in particular related to the endogenization of 
the analogy partitions. Okay, so the general uh, kind of uh, strategic environment I will have in mind is as follows. In the first stage, nature would select the types of the various players. Tau I stands for the type of player I, tau J of player J. Only player I would know his, his type and he would have some uh, assumption about the distribution of the other types. And then once these types are drawn by nature, players will proceed in sequence to decide on actions. And I'm assuming it's a game of perfect monitoring. So all past actions are observed by everyone. So H in this tree represents the uh, action space previously played. So a contingency, I use this word informally at the start, will refer to an object like that. J tau H, meaning that at this stage of the game tree, player J will have to, to make an action, which is denoted AG. And I will allow in this uh, strategic environment players to play simultaneously or a subset of those. So this is allowed. So that's the class of games I'm considering. Some games are excluded, like games with private monitoring where you players would receive signals about the actions uh, made by other players. But I could generalize to that, but for the talk today, it will be only uh, that class of games. Now, this is very standard game. The, the only thing which is uh, not standard uh, will be in how I think of a type. The type of a player tau i will be made of two parts. Theta i is the usual notion of type. So in particular, it determines how payoffs are uh, 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 computed. It may also include uh, payoff irrelevant uh, dimensions like signals about the type of the others. So this is the regular type that we are familiar with from, uh, uh, well, Arseni, well, uh, Mertens uh, for more elaborate description of, of the type. The novel dimension in the type is the analogy partition or the cognitive type, which is, uh, which will refer to the kind of core statistics player I has access to. And this, the way I will model that is uh, by uh, endowing a player with CI, the cognitive type, which will be a partition of the set of all contingencies in this big uh, extensive form. So all the J tau H where Mr. J has to make a decision. Can yeah, I ask an, an, J an tau H, a contingency. Can I ask an orientation question? Sure. Uh, what, the fact that there is no comma between tau and h, is there something there to, uh, to deduce from it? There, there is no, sorry, I, I missed the... So j tau h will mean that j is of type tau j. Tau is a profile of types, right? So uh, and h is the uh, histories uh, that the, the past actions, when we so, arrive at this point in the game. But, but why don't you separate between the two? Should we think of the two together? I prefer, I mean, it's a matter of uh, notation. I, I think, I thought it was easier to present things like that. But by this contingency, I mean, Mr. J, we tau, tau J playing after the draw of nature is tau and then history is H. This is what I mean by that, right? Okay. That's uh, just a notation, but you, you're right. There could be other ways of presenting it. Um, so one requirement I make though, which is important, it parallels a bit the way we introduce games of incomplete information is that whenever I put two contingencies in the same analogy class alpha i, uh, I require that the action space of the corresponding players should be the same. Yeah, we do that when we speak of information partition. And here I do the same. And why do I do that? Because I want to model players who would be exposed to the aggregate statistic about the aggregate behavior in each analogy class. So I need to be able to compare actions in different contingencies. And that's a simple way to achieve that. So the notation here is that beta of alpha i will stand for 
the aggregate statistic about the behavior in the analogy class alpha, which is a collection of contingencies J tau H. Okay. On the top of that, in most of, the, of application, in some application, I relax that, but I will be assuming players know uh, the, the joint distribution with which nature picks the various types, and it knows all the description of the extensive form as well as its own utility. Solution concept. So, uh, can I just, Philip, can I ask a question sure. just for clarification? Here you follow the tradition, uh, and I think you do it because you want to put focus on this partitioning. Uh, if you want to go for realism and behavioral economics, you could also say perhaps they would have different priors, right? Uh, I could, could. Would, is your framework such that it would be allow that or it would be very hard to do that? No, it's not difficult. The, my preference though, because I will later, you will see why it's my preference, is that because I want to derive this solution concept from uh, 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 as an outcome of a learning process, if I want to, to think of uh, uh, subjective views about how nature selects uh, types, I would think of nature as a player and I could embed, I, I could uh, view players reasoning about this specific player with nature in the same way as I'm assuming they do with other players. So in some application I do that, so it, it will give it will allow them to have possibly erroneous uh, views about the distribution uh, of nature. But I will not do it in the way it's done in uh, the subjective approach by Arseni. Uh, but I, I will come back to that later, I hope. For, um, okay, so solution concept. So this, so this slide parallels, if you wish, the uh, uh, the way we would enrich a game of complete information to introduce uh, incomplete information. Well, let's say Arseni. Well, even though he started from Nash, but let me let me assume he, he starts from Zelten and and then add the uh, uh, incomplete information. He would do that, and then once this so this is a, an extra feature of the primitive of the description of the strategic environment. So he it's this partitioning CI. And now we'll go to the solution concept. The solution concept will have two parts, as we uh, usually have, I would say, in uh, uh, solution concept. The first is a description of how players pick their best responses. And my assumption is that they, I want that to be based only on the aggregate statistics. So the best response will be defined as follows. So player I with tau, tau I, uh, require to play a best response to his analogy-based expectation, so the beta of alpha i in the various analogy classes alpha i forming is a uh, cognitive partition. And the notion of best response is as follows. Um, it will just play a best response to the subjective perception that Mr. J at tau h, meaning Mr. J with tau, tau j after history h has been played, will play according to the aggregate be, uh, distribution of behavior in the analogy class alpha i to which the contingency j tau h belong. What, what's the uh, rational for that? Suppose you only know the aggregate behavior. The simplest representation of how your, the players behave is to just assume that in every element of the analogy class alpha i, the behavior match the aggregate. So you, you can, I could be a little more formal and say, using, for example, the automaton representation, that it's the representation that would use the least number of states to describe the strategy of others and be compatible with this uh, course knowledge. So that's my rationale for doing that. The second part will be how the analogy-based expectations beta are uh, derived in equilibrium. And here I will impose, uh, as we usually do in, in uh, equilibrium concept, a consistency requirement. So for an, an analogy class alpha i that would be rich in equilibrium, so P sigma of tau h will just denote, sorry, I didn't define that, but let me define it orally. P sigma of tau h will denote the probability 
with which the, uh, the, 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 new, the, the history tau h is rich when players play according to sigma and nature plays according to p. We, we, we saw that before. So I'm not adding the, the strategy of nature here. And so the requirement of consistency will be that for every analogy class alpha i, which is sometimes rich in equilibrium, meaning that at least one of the contingency in alpha i has a positive probability, it must be, so the requirement is that beta of alpha i should be a, a weighted average of what happens in the various contingencies in alpha i. So what J does in uh, uh, tau h is described by this sigma tau j of h. That's his true behavior at this contingency. And this expression is a weighted average of the behaviors in the various contingencies. It's not any weighted average. Uh, it's a weighted average that respects the relative frequency of the various contingencies. So if one contingency is very rarely rich, it will not contribute much to the aggregate. Yeah, and the, the weighting is this, and my rationale for that is uh, uh, learning. That suppose uh, players keep playing according to the strategy profile sigma, and think of a statistician who would try to collect uh, frequencies of, uh, uh, re regarding the behavior in alpha i, you would end up with uh, this expression. So I don't have at all in mind that beta would be uh, derived by introspection. My view is that this beta is the outcome of uh, a, a learning process, right? And so sigma will be an AB, an analogy-based expectation equilibrium, if every player is playing a best response given his uh, type as defined in the first bullet point. And the analogy-based expectations are consistent. And for those analogy classes that are never rich, meaning that this uh, is zero, then I'm refining this through the trembling trick, if you wish, like that and it. Okay, so uh, this is not new. So uh, maybe there are criticisms of that, but I'm not playing on that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm following uh, the Zelton's uh, uh, input on this dimension. Let's review basic properties of this uh, notion of equilibrium. Well, first, I won't spend a lot of time here, but here is a sketch of the kind of learning environments I have in mind that would give rise to the result that the AB are the steady states of this learning process. So it's, it's a learning environment where every player would play just once. You would have population of players. Each period you had, would have random matching uh, that would respect the, the P probabilities. And at the end of a play, pl uh, a player given his type would be informed of the past frequencies in the various analogy classes as given by the empirical frequencies, like, it, like we do in fictitious play, if you wish. Right, so the claim is that that's not very hard to, 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 to see that the steady state of such learning processes would correspond to the AB. Well, if I want to have the refinement with the trembling, I would need to perturb a bit the learning uh, and, uh, process. But uh, second uh, result. I, if, Philip, can I ask yeah. a question? Uh, this interpretation is very close to John Nash's uh, mass action interpretation. Mm -hmm. You remember which he had in his PhD thesis, his, uh, his most favorite interpretation of Nash equilibrium. Uh, right. No, I, I'm doing, in a way, that, I, that's, I mean, I, I don't want, yes. I'm so putting I, I myself want... in these great shoes, yeah, right. It's, I, this is what the, my view on, the, on, on this concept, like, like uh, as you said, right? Uh, sometimes so, so in, in the game theory literature, you have different views, like the introspective view, right. Uh, it's not at all the view I have in mind, which, which by the way, I would relate to uh, my point, the more point I made earlier that I don't at all have in mind that the betas would be derived by introspection. In fact, the, the, the aggregate statistics come as the output of this learning process. But, but my, my question would be, if one thinks of Nash equilibrium in this context, the, as he did, uh, could one also think of this not as another solution concept, but actually this is a Nash equilibrium if I specify it as a game where you get signals and the, the values of the signals are partitionings? Well, would, we, it be, we, would it be the equivalent with a Nash equilibrium or such a game? 
I don't think so, but we will review. Uh, I promise in one slide we'll discuss links to Nash. Okay. Uh, maybe not exactly the question you have in mind, but um, okay. Let me. Uh, the question is it a solution concept or is it a game form? And Nash equilibrium. That's my question. Um, let me postpone a bit. Uh, I will uh, definitely come back to the question of linking the concept to Nash. Uh, may, maybe not the version you have in mind. Let, let's, let, let's keep that in mind. So the uh, second basic result, well, this one, I, I don't know, it parallels either Zelton's existence proof for trembling hand or uh, Krebs-Wilson proof for uh, sequential equilibrium is to show that in finite environments, well, meaning finite number of stage, finite number of actions, finite number of types, uh, uh, they're all, and in my case, finite number of, uh, well, but that's, that derives from it, of analogy partitions, uh, uh, there always exists at least one analogy-based expectation equilibrium. You can show that using Kakutani's fixed point theorem. Okay, so it's sim very similar proof to the one Krebs and Wilson uh, derived, for example. A third basic, I'm still in the very basic uh, points, right? Uh, is that in the special case in which for all types, uh, uh, they would use as the analogy partition, the finest analogy partition, meaning that every single J tau H would be a separate analogy class. Then in this special case, uh, the analogy-based expectation equilibrium I de define coincide with the trembling end equilibrium, where the way I define it is the extensive form trembling end equilibrium. Okay, so well, this is reassuring. It means that in the special case where I assume people would receive very detailed statistics about the behavior in every contingency, what I just defined coincide with well-known uh, solution concepts. Now comes maybe, I, I hope I will address some of what Jorgen, uh, maybe not exactly your question, but it, it will be my, uh, my answer to your question. Okay, so let, let's illustrate maybe some uh, differences with Nash equilibrium. So the, the, and let me consider just to see also the, the working of this concept. Uh, th that's also the purpose of this is, so it's a two game environment, G1, G2, the, the games are symmetric. So I only showed you the payoff of player one, X, Y, Z, T. There are two actions, A, B in each game. And let's assume the two games are equally likely. Uh, and finally, let me assume in terms of the analogy partition that uh, players put the two games in the same analogy class, right? So they only receive feedback or uh, information about the aggregate behavior over the two games, but not game by game. So I claim that playing A in game one and B in game two for both players, I, I'm restricting to symmetric strategy, uh, will be an AB whenever X plus Z is no smaller than Y plus Z. So how do you see that? By consistency, if the behavior is A in one and B in two, because the two games are equally likely, the aggregate behavior will be a 50-50 lottery between A and B, yeah, which I denote with these symbols. Now I have to check whether players will, uh, uh, the strategy I, I assume players were following will be a best response to beta. So for this to be the case, it has to be true that in game one, if you expect the opponent to play 50-50 lottery between A and B, you find it best to play A, which require that the average X plus Z divided by two is no smaller than Y plus Z divided by two, which is exactly this condition. And note that if Y were strictly bigger than X, which is compatible with this inequality, then the AB we've just constructed would not be a Nash equilibrium. So it's a different concept at least if we stick to the original game, just ignoring the CI parts in the description of the game. Um, a second, well, you may ask here, I did a very special thing. So we may ask, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we may ask, is it possible to interpret this concept AB 
by changing the payoff and or the information structure of players. And this example is aimed at illustrating at least with some form of simple transformation, it's not possible to do it. So of course, I, I cannot do it with a specific equilibrium because you can always rationalize a, a specific behavior if you just put one payoff whenever it's supposed to do this action and zero otherwise. So this is not interesting. The more interesting question related to, to that is, assume we have a, a set of equilibria. Can we, with a single change of payoff and information, keep the same set of equilibria with Nash? Yeah, and I claim this is an illustration of not. Suppose we have, like before, these two games e being equally likely. Suppose both players put the two games in the same analogy class. So I claim we have four pure strategy AB, AA or BB, meaning A in both games or B in both games. So that's a general property. If a Nash equilibrium is the same across games and you put all the games in the same analogy class, then it remains an, uh, an AB. The second one is A in game one and B in game two. So this corresponds to uh, what I illustrated in a previous slide. But note that we cannot have B in game one and A in game two as an AB, why? Because if this were so, the aggregate behavior would be again a 50-50 lottery between A and B. Yeah, but we saw that the best response to this lottery would be A in game one and B in game two, so it would not rationalize this behavior. And I claim that no matter how you change the payoffs and the information structure, you would not be able to, uh, to obtain uh, this configuration as the set of equilibria. Why? It's obvious because since sometimes you have behaviors which are different in one and two, it must be that you must have complete information in the usual sense. Yeah. And secondly, once you have complete information, the fact that these two are Nash would be Nash equilibria would be would imply that the force should also be a Nash equilibrium. So you, I mean, I, I would go, won't go to give you the details of that, but it illustrates why you cannot do it. Let me try to give another, another uh, uh, illustration of a specific aspect of the solution concept. This time related to the endogenous weighting in uh, uh, the consistency definition. So the simplest way to illustrate uh, uh, some uh, 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 effect of that is to, to consider a two-stage game. So I need some sequentiality, otherwise you wouldn't have the endogeneity. So the simplest is to have two-stage game. So player one choose between left and right. Then player two, after observing the move of player one, would choose between left and right. Well, this dashed line doesn't mean two does not observe what, what one did. It, I will use that to say that one puts these two contingencies in the same analogy class. Okay, it's not the usual uh, convention. Now, these, these arrows here mean that player two would play right after left and left after right. I haven't written pay of two, player two payoff, yeah, only player one. But for player two, it's a, it's a simple decision problem. So it's described by these arrows. Uh, okay. I claim that under these conditions, under these two inequalities, you, would, you cannot support an AB in pure strategy. So let's review the logic of that. Suppose player one were to play left. If he were to play left, then according to the endogenous weighting, all the, the, aggregate, the, the, the aggregate behavior will only be, deter, will be affected by what happens in this node. Why? Because in a way, there would be no observation of what happens here because one would never to play right. Okay, so if one were to always play left, uh, he would conclude that the aggregate behavior of two is that he plays always right. But now the best response to right would be to play right if u1 of rr is strictly b bigger than u1 of lr, right? which is one of the conditions here. Similarly, always playing right will not be an ABE because now the difference is that the weighting changes. Now all the weight should be on the behavior at this contingency. So 
uh, beta, the, the aggregate behavior should be that player two always play left. And if one thinks that two always play left, the best response would be left because you, whenever u1 of LL is strictly bigger than u1 of LL. And the inexistence of a pure strategy AB is a consequence of the endogenous weighting. For example, if I had assumed equal weighting, no matter what you do, then as we have in the backward induction algorithm, if you wish, there would always be a pure strategy best response. Yeah? But because of the endogenous weighting, it, uh, does, it's not the case here. So I don't think I will go through these slides carefully here, but this is a, an elaboration of uh, the shape of the mixed strategy uh, AB in this case. So I re rewrote the payoff. So uh, you can see that after big L, the best response is small r. It gives one instead of zero and uh, the opposite after right. And I, I wrote the payoff in, uh, as we do in normal form representation. Uh, we, we, and, and maybe the only thing I would mention about when you solve the uh, equilibrium analysis for this game is that you get that player one should be mixing. And interestingly, <clears throat> uh, he should be make, playing left all the more often that x minus y is big relative to uh, the other parameters. So which is, I ju just mentioning that because this is something we, some people complain about the comparative static we see in the Nash equilibrium with mixed strategy, which here, by the way, would impose that player one should be mixing 50-50 to make player two indifferent between his two actions. Here in the AB logic, you no longer have that and you get behaviors which some people claim is more uh, 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 intuitive in the sense that when X is bigger, player one plays more often left than right. Yeah. Um, so I won't go through the details of this, but they, they, it follows a very different logic. Uh, in fact, at the end of the day, the, the, what, what, what you would observe in the interaction is uh, 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 a lottery between left and right and right and left, so between these two outcomes. But the implicit view of what the uh, first player would be reasoning here on is that he would only pay attention to uh, the marginal uh, distribution of what the second player is doing, since he would not pay attention to the correlation of what he does with uh, what uh, player two does. So it can be related to what behavioral uh, uh, economists have called correlation neglect, if you wish. We, if you have in mind that players see the old data, yeah, which I won't necessarily have in mind. Before we move to applications, let me try to give you the way uh, I, I, I think of these analogy partitions, which is the novel uh, uh, ingredient. Um, so in the various papers I've written on this subject, I, I, I view three different kinds of motivations. One is uh, um, uh, thinking of the analogy partition as a, a way to describe the kind of course statistic or course feedback uh, players have exogenously ac access to. For example, if you have in mind applications where you never get to see the identity of a player when you see his action from previous interactions. Then it makes sense to say that people will uh, bundle in the same uh, category or an partition, uh, analogy class, all contingencies which are, can be obtained by permutation of the name of the players, which could be called player anonymous analogy partition. In some other applications, you may have in mind that when you see actions, you never get to see the beliefs that uh, uh, the player had at the time he made his action. So this would suggest considering what I would call the payoff relevant analogy partition, where you would bundle states according to what is payoff relevant, but possibly including different states which differ only according to the payoff to the to the belief uh, dimension of the state. Another way, another possible use of uh, these analogy partitions uh, is as a way to model uh, uh, psychological biases. Uh, so I've used this to model, well, I mentioned that already in the previous abstract example, uh, 
to model correlation neglect, it can be used to model extrapolation bias. So these acronyms, acronyms stands for fundamental attribution error and the third one selection neglect. So I have different papers where I've tried to say that this game theoretic approach could be used to model what psychologists or behavioral economists have uh, been talk talking about in uh, relation to anomalies uh, uh, in the lab. A third uh, use, which maybe is the one I find most fascinating, but unfortunately the one I've least to say about, uh, it was probably my original motivation, to be frank with you, is that I thought, and, and you can infer a bit of that from the way I presented my motivation, is I, I, I always thought from the start of this analogy partition as a way to facilitate the learning of the, of the player, with the view that the coarser the analogy partition, the fewer things you have to learn about your environment, and presumably, but this has to be modeled, which I haven't, uh, uh, the easier to learn it. Okay. Uh, I will maybe at the very end of the talk come back, uh, if time permits, to one I, uh, current idea I have related to this uh, third, bu third bullet point. That's the end of the description of the solution concept, maybe some basic properties. And now uh, the aim would be to suggest how it works in some applications. Uh, let me try if, uh, you, uh, you, unless you have questions, to, il to, to illustrate uh, this concept through uh, uh, a speculative trade uh, environment. So I will take the uh, a, a toy version of speculative trade proposed by John Genacopoulos with only two players. It's a betting game. I, I guess you are familiar with that. So it's a two player game, one and two, who have to simultaneously decide to bet or not bet. And there are uh, uh, different states in this economy, but let me uh, uh, this decompose the state as follows. There are four equally likely scenarios, so it's not a word that is used in, in game theory, but let, let me use it for uh, uh, the purpose of describing the, this interaction. Four equally likely scenarios, B, C, D, E, and each scenario is attached to a draw from a random variable, uh, which is the same for each scenario, and the, distrib the, the distribution of this draw is assumed to be uh, uh, symmetric around zero. So the state, if you wish, is uh, uh, the combination of x and xk. And right, so that, that's the way we would define a state in game theory. Okay, now on the top of that, the payoffs are the ones we are familiar with in this betting game. So the bets will be implemented only if both players decide to bet. So BB means that both play players decide to bet. And XK will be the payoff received by player one if the scenario is K and the profile of the X is X, right? So X, so one, and one would receive XK and two would have to pay XK to uh, one if both bet and the scenario K and X is a true. So that's the description of the payoff. In terms of information, let me assume that players observe X but they don't observe the scenario perfectly. Uh, they, are the, they are either informed that the scenario is either B, C, or D. So that's information structure I upper bar. Or they are informed that the scenario is either B, D, or C. That's the information I lower bar. OK, so the exact meaning, well, for you, I don't think I need to do that. To do that but, uh, of that would be that if the real scenario is B, let's say, in the first case, play, uh, player one would be informed that the scenario is either B or C. In the second case, he would be informed that the scenario is either B or D. And he would be informed of X in all cases. So in the standard approach, well, meaning with Nash uh, equilibrium concept, uh, uh, as a consequence of, you, if you wish, of um, uh, Oman's uh, uh, agreeing to disagree uh, uh, theorem or the, the no trade theorem, uh, you, you can show that there can be no bad being implemented with strictly positive probability. You know? 
So here it's in a way simpler in the sense that I have a zero sum game, so I can rely in fact more directly on von Neumann uh, analysis of zero sum games. Uh, players can guarantee zero by not betting. So zero is obviously the value of this game. Okay. Uh, Philippe, uh, can I have a question? Yeah. Uh, regarding the model. So somehow there are no probabilities here. I mean, L upper bar and, and, and L lower bar, or I upper bar and I lower bar. Is right, so you, you're correct. I didn't spec specify that. So um, uh, I guess I, let's have in mind they are equally likely. Uh, okay, equally likely. And, and the could be, uh, there is another parameter, which is the correlation of the information across the two players, mm -hmm. which I will, dis I will uh, uh, mention the property of that in later. But you're right, that's another, another uh, parameter of the, uh, the model, right? Mm -hmm. You're correct. Okay. Yeah, Let, thank let's you. have in mind the two information uh, structure are equally likely, and there could be correlation in the information of the two players. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that now this closes the description of the Bayesian game. Uh, okay, now let me modify, if you wish, the cognitive dimension. And let me assume that both players have a single analogy partition, so it's a single type on that dimension. And let me assume they are exposed about past similar play about to two aggregate statistics, which I would refer to as the two type error analogies partition or the two type error statistics, by which I mean they would be informed from about a previous play about the frequency with which there was a bet whenever it was in the exposed interest of the player to do so. So for play one, whenever X, the, the, the scenario is K and XK is positive, I would say it would be in the exposed interest of player one to bet. So let me put all of these into uh, the same analogy class, as well as I'm not, I will not distinguish the two players, the same for player two, right? So that's one big analogy class, it correspond to type one, type one error, if you wish. And there will be an aggregate statistic, beta plus, about the aggregate frequency with which there is a bet in this big cluster of uh, contingencies. And by symmetry, beta minus will represent the aggregate probability with which there is a bet in the set whenever it was not in the exposed interest of the player to do so. So here I'm not including zero, but let's say this has zero probability, so it won't affect my analysis. Okay, so, uh, uh, the, the, and for obvious reasons, I, I, I can relate this analogy partition to this uh, two type pair uh, notion that is familiar in statistics. Is it clear the, uh, uh, the, the, the notion of partitioning? Okay. Now let, let's do the analysis. So the view is that play, players would make their choice of strategy based on beta minus and beta plus, these two aggregate statistics. Suppose player one is told the scenario is either B or C and with this value of X. I claim E will bet whenever I have this inequality. Why? E will reason as follows. Um, well, the two scenarios are priori equally likely. But I know that if scenario B were to occur, then I would expect player two, it would not be in his exposed interest to bet because XB is positive. So for, for player two, he, he would get a negative payoff. So I would expect him, according to the AB logic, to bet with probability by beta minus. And similarly, in, in the C scenario, I would one would expect two to bet with probability beta plus because uh, uh, this uh, uh, state would belong to the sec to the first analogy class, right? And so he, he, he would, based on this reasoning, he would make the inference that suppose beta plus is bigger than beta minus, uh, in the relevant uh, uh, events, it's more likely that C would occur if I contingent, if, if I uh, uh, contingent, <clears throat> I, sorry, I uh, base my reasoning on the contingency that two is betting. So it will be more likely that two is betting, that, that the state is C than uh, it is B. And so I had this weighted uh, weight, uh, uh, sum. 
Yeah, I know it's, well, I, I was not maybe very eloquent, sorry for my bad English to explain this, but what I'm saying is that there is some non-trivial inference being made as long as beta minus is dif different from beta plus in the sense that like in Omans, if you wish, famous uh, results, players are trying to make inference. What does it mean about the, the odds of the state uh, that uh, the other player is betting? Yeah, so there are reasoning of this sort taking place here. And in fact, on the top of that, what, what I didn't mention here is that, of course, the beta minus and beta plus are not arbitrary numbers. They should be derived from consistency, right? It's not, they, they are not uh, a primitive of the model. So if you do, so it's not trivial in general to, to do this thing. So I, I try to do in, in uh, the draft, uh, 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 that, I, I, that you can access or that, that describe this paper, uh, you do some uh, uh, simulations. And for example, if you take for the X, the uniform distribution between minus one, one, you can show there is no bet in equilibrium. So it's not the case that you will always have bets. But whenever the, the X is either the uniform distribution between minus one, one with probability lambda or the binary distribution minus epsilon epsilon with probability one minus lambda, when lambda is half, you have these non-trivial non -trivial numbers and you have that sometimes. More generally, you can show that consistency will always imply in the setting I've described that it's more likely that you bet uh, uh, whenever it's your, in your exposed interest to bet, meaning that beta plus will be bigger than beta minus, which will have an interesting consequence that you will have bet or trade, to come back to the economic version of this uh, uh, toy uh, example, you will have strategic trade only when the two players do not have the same information. So it's now I can relate to uh, Alan's previous question. So if there is perfect correlation, you won't have any bet, any trade in this example. More generally, it's a consequence of this uh, uh, general feature. So to have trades, uh, you, you must have asymmetric information, which, well, some economists who in fact launched this uh, idea of looking at strategic uh, trade thought it was intuitive, yeah, that you, you want to relate trade to the asymmetry, which, by the way, you would not necessarily have if you were to follow the uh, subjective prior route, which some people have suggested to get away from uh, the no trade theorem. Because with the subjective prior routes, even if we have the same information on whether the, the state is either B or C, if we are both very optimistic, meaning we put most weight on the state which is more favorable to us, we can support trade with the subjective prior approach. But this is no, you cannot get that with uh, uh, this ABE approach with this uh, 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 analogy partition. So I see that I don't have much time uh, left if, I, if I'm not wrong. Um, can, can I ask how much time I, I have or? Yeah, you are uh, 10 minutes. Then, so I will skip, unfortunately, the uh, second application I had here, which I liked, but uh, it was an illustration of deception and, and how ABE works in uh, uh, multi-stage in environments uh, involving some kind of reputation building. And, uh, uh, but let me skip it. So it's related to papers I wrote with the, 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 the name theory of deception that was with David Etanger, and I have a paper with Larry Samuelson on uh, where we, we, we revisit models of reputation with the ABE approach and show that reputation uh, motives can even emerge in zero sum interactions, which uh, is not possible with uh, the rational approach. Right. Okay. Let me skip that. Let me skip a forcery this slide, which was about aimed at describing uh, the various application I have considered in the last 20 years. Uh, so if you are interested, have a look at the, either the original papers or the, the new survey pa paper I wrote where I give a, a short summary of this. Um, and let me instead in the remaining 10 minutes try to describe, well, first 
how it relates, in my view, to existing concepts. Uh, maybe we'll come back to Jorgen's earlier question now. And as how, how I view uh, 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 the next step for this research agenda. So uh, I, I tried to, to, to give some uh, hints about these things. So the, 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 the main, uh, I would say, uh, 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 solution concept that, that uh, I want to relate ABE to uh, are as follows. Well, first is, I already mentioned it, the, the Nash equilibrium with subjective prior that was introduced by Arseni. So I have two comments to make about that. So first, what I'm doing is in a way uh, uh, allowing players to form subjective theories about the play of other players. You know, through this beta and uh, the best response to the beta. So the, the traditional uh, approach suggested by Sunny viewed forming subjective prior about nature, not about the other players. Yeah, in the Nash equilibrium with subjective prior, you have subjective prior about the strategy of nature, but you have correct expectation about the, how other players behave as a function of their type. So here in my approach is a sort of dual, but as I said, maybe to uh, uh, Jorgen, I could extend the approach to view play, uh, nature as a player and extend the notion of uh, the analogy equilibrium to include uh, uh, subjective views about how nature behaves. I do that in some papers. But more importantly, I would say, uh, in my approach, the subjective view is not a primitive, unlike in Narsani's approach to subjective prior. The subjective view is shaped by the core statistics of the analogy partitions. The primitive is the analogy partition, not the, the, the subjective uh, view. And because of that, so I don't have time to get into the details, but I think I'm not the only one to have said that. It's not easy to interpret the Nash equilibrium with subjective prior from a, a learning perspective because there is a tension. How can you be? How can you learn correctly the strategy of the other players and remain completely uh, subjective and possibly wrong from a learning perspective about nature? There is a tension. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's not very natural. In my case, well, if you accept the kind of learning story, I alluded to, I don't have this problem. In fact, everything was cooked to make it uh, easy to interpret from a learning perspective. Getting to learning, another leading approach, I would say, related to uh, uh, steady state approach related to learning is the so-called self-confirming equilibrium. So you have had various versions of that. Uh, the one I want, the, maybe the, the, the one most uh, advertised in economics is the one uh, pro uh, proposed by Frudenberg and Krebs and Frudenberg and Levine saying that you only observe what happens on the equilibrium path, but not necessarily off. It's not the one that would fit best for my purpose. The one that would fit best is the most general one proposed, in fact, by Betty Galli earlier, where you would assume after the play of a game, people receive some feedback or signal about the play, which could be anything. And he proposed the notion of equilibrium, self-confirming equilibrium, or well, he probably gave a different name at the time, but conjectural equilibrium at the time, but uh, where you require that players have subjective theories that would be consistent with the signals or the feedback they observe. And he would not put any restriction on uh, uh, these subjective theories as long as they are consistent. So compared in AB, you can view AB as a special case of this very general notion of self-confirming equilibrium for the signal that would mimic the kind of uh, aggregate statistic I was alluding to. Whenever we play, you would be informed of the, very, of the actions for the various analogy classes that were uh, reached in this, uh, in this game. But very importantly, uh, uh, a distinctive feature of AB is that I'm not considering any subjective theory consistent with this feedback. I'm considering the simplest one. And because of that, it allowed me to say that in some cases, AB is different from Nash, for example. 
Whereas with a more permissive approach, of course, Nash can never be uh, refuted because it, having the correct expectation, of course, cannot be uh, inconsistent with the feedback you receive, even if you receive absolutely no feedback. Right, so this selection allows me to be much more predictive, if you wish, than uh, the general approach. And um, it has much more structure, which allow me to, to, to go further in application. So I don't have time to go through these two more recent approaches. They are closely related to AB. To some extent, they are, I would say, special cases of AB. But um, well, cursed equilibrium, at least some version of it is a special case. And, and the other version is, I think, more problematic, but you have to read the paper to uh, get a sense of that. I won't have. So this slide is, I will spend even less time on it. So in, in this paper, I try, I mean, it's, it's a bit, uh, th that's why the, the paper is a bit too long. I apologize. It's more than 100 pages long. Uh, because I try to review most of the, the approaches of bound and rationality in games. Um, each time trying to suggest the link and difference with the spirit of uh, AB. But I would say, uh, putting a step back, that one, sometimes one critique you hear about all these approaches, bounded rationality in games, or uh, including mine, is, well, how would, should we choose one or the other, right? So who would give us uh, a guideline about when is it more appropriate to use one or the other? So I won't give you uh, a recipe for, for that. That would be uh, too much for me to do that. But maybe one advantage of AB compared to some of these other proposals is that it's quite flexible through the use of these analogy partitions in the same way as I would say, uh, uh, well, uh, it has a, a lot of flexibility, but one critique one could uh, raise in relation to that flexibility is how do we choose the analogy partitions? Yeah, maybe it's, uh, so it's too flexible. So that, that's the opposite uh, critique, right? So may, maybe, okay. So it, I would say it all depends on the kind of motivation you have in mind. If you have in mind, it's a way to model kind of exogenously coarse feedback players had access to. Remember my story about player anonymous uh, analogy partition or payoff relevant analogy partition. I would say with that kind of interpretation, it's the kind of application you have in mind that should dictate the choice of analogy partition. If you think that the data that people had access to in real words don't give access to the beliefs, then go for the payoff relevant or don't give access to the identity of players, then go for the player anonymous and uh, uh, analogy partition. With the second kind of motivation the, the, as a way to model psychological biases, I would say, well, maybe you will say, I, I don't want to do any job, but uh, we should ask psychologists, what do you think subjects find more salient in a contingency? And let's try to use their input to categorize contingencies according to what is more salient. In fact, this is why I, I was able to use this framework to model uh, correlation neglect or selection neglect, because all these biases can be related to what people uh, ignore from the contingency or find more salient, depending on the jargon you prefer. But the third bullet point about as a way to facilitate learning require more work so I'm not saying economists are the best place to do that, but maybe you are the best place or the, the, I would say related to that, that, in my view, machine learning people are the best place because these guys, well, no, I'm not one, but I hope some of you may be or may be closer to those. The, 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 the everyday job of these guys is to simplify complex data sets to make those more uh, uh, usable. Right, and my the current work I'm trying to, to, to do is to use simple techniques or spirit of techniques they are considering to, uh, uh, to put more structure on the analogy partition. So one of them that looks particularly relevant is the so-called k-means clustering. So k-means clustering is when you have lots of data points, suppose you want to cluster those by proximity, so you can use different notion of distance. Usually they use the Euclidean distance. Uh, 
it's not clear it's the most uh, relevant from a game theoretic viewpoint. I would prefer uh, 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 entropy uh, notion. Well, I, I'm, uh, <clears throat> if you want to compare distribution of behaviors. So you, you could do that to put structure. Uh, uh, and now the novel thing compared to machine learning is once you cluster into an analogy partition, you change behaviors through my work, through my uh, concept. So you have an endogeneity, which is, I mean, potentially interesting. Yeah? The machine learners would tell you, given the data, how to cluster, and then how you cluster give you, gives rise to different kinds of data. I would say the bias variance trade-off is another uh, uh, basic idea in statistics or machine learning that I would find relevant. So maybe it's the original idea I had in mind that e if you treat states too finely, then presumably you wouldn't have enough data in, uh, in your observations and they would not be reliable enough, right? So the bias variance trade-off idea would be that you, you bundle uh, situation so that you have enough data or in reduced form, I would, this is the way I'm considering applying this uh, to uh, game theoretic approach to say that you, you want every analogy class to be rich with enough probability. Yeah, to, as, a, as a shortcut for this bias rate, variance trade off. Um, and then it would put some structure, for example, in extensive form games, it would not allow you to, to treat off the pass nodes as separate analogy classes because those would never be reached in equilibrium. Yeah, so I, I would, I haven't done work here, but I'm just suggesting uh, how I, th I see a uh, possible next step for this research agenda. There are other approaches that in fact, maybe I haven't checked, maybe some of you, Eyal Winter may, may have done work related to this. So, where you, you, maybe Jorgen would maybe int more uh, into that kind of approach where you, you could think of the choice of an energy partition as being done at a kind of a meta level, let's call it evolutionary stage, where people would learn in aggregate what works best for the... So um, my, my preference would be more for A, but I'm open to other approaches. And um, yeah, I think we should be very open that, that on, on this, as I think that the, there is no unique way of approaching that in my view. Well, I've resisted that a lot in the last 20 years, even though I've been requested that on each submission on this uh, research project ever since, but because for a long time, I thought the two should be decomposed and I still think so, but maybe now after 20 years, I feel it's time to, uh, to go into that route. And uh, let, let me stop here. I have a last slide, but uh, it's not needed. Yeah, I can skip it. Thank you very much, Philippe. Uh, question, any questions? Maybe I would uh, venture. Uh, thank you, Philippe. I, 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 I like this uh, approach because I think it's really fundamental to, to human cognition and, and perception. I mean, we cannot live without some sort of partitioning or something like that. And, uh, and that's done always. Uh, and I think of this, uh, how you take them as exogenous and that's how one can treat an individual. One can imagine a slower time scale where cultures evolve or maybe evolution and things like that. I know, and we have, you know, for example, when you do physics laboratory experiments and you have some kind of want to measure the you know, law of gravity and you have red balls and blue balls, but otherwise the same material, you say that to the students don't care about the culture, uh, color and then, you know, and so on. We do this without even thinking about it all the time. When we teach our kids what to do, uh, you know, focus on some aspects and not on the others. And that's, I think, necessary for our brains to function more or less. Also, what you talk about is, is a topic in, in linguistics, in theoretical linguistics, because there, you know, our words are like partitions, you know, what is a dog? And then you make a limit of no. some of these are called dogs and others not. And then they also think about uh, sometimes treating them as exogenous categories and we have words for them. And sometimes they evolve as, you know, technology evolves, we get more finer partitionings of computers and stuff. Uh, 
but also they think of, of evolutionary sources. You know, why do this culture have so many words for something like, you know, snow or something? Yeah, well, they live in the north. It matters if the snow is icy or not, and so forth, you know. So we, we, we have learned something from linguistics also. And then usually one treats individuals when they speak as taking these categories as you do for a given. Uh, and then they do, they, they communicate using those. And this is also, and in then there is one additional thing which you don't have. These are used to communicate between people. I mean, it, it was very hard for us to communicate without words. So we have, uh, and so forth. And, and, and here it's more like a decision maker. Uh, I, I, so I, I think it's a very sound thing to do, but the problem is of course, one can do it in so many ways. Uh, and and, uh, I, and I would I would be no and I would be interested sometimes sometimes it seems to me that maybe one can think of this as another solution concept uh, I'm not sure or one could say that I can recast this whole thing and it is actually a form of you know form of Nash equilibrium or some other well known equilibrium concept but but uh, the game form is different so we give them some you know you, you frame the information to an individual in, in some partitionings and so on and, yeah. and that is something you you touched upon it and you you claim that it's not always possible. I think that I would need to think more about it. I mean, to be convinced. Okay, let me try. I mean, you, you said a lot, lot of things. I would need a lot of time to... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so about linguistics, I'm very happy you raised that. In fact, Elon mentioned the ERC grant. I didn't expect that. But you, you, so in, in my proposal, I explicitly mentioned linguistics. So if someone... So you're right, I didn't work on that. So if there is someone... Uh, would have more knowledge on linguistics than me, I mean, which is very easy, uh, and would like to help me. I completely agree that uh, words are like uh, um, uh, classes, or uh, and it's very natural. So I thought of doing experiments where I would try to trigger analogy classes by uh, changing names. I don't know, like using Greek letters from some games and uh, Latin letters for others and see whether this kind of uh, uh, formulation would trigger some uh, grouping. So I'm very much with you. And as for linguistics, I think even there, it's an, these are open uh, subject, but uh, mixing that with game theory looks, uh, sounds to me like an exciting project. And uh, uh, I'm very much with, with, with you on that. Um, about evolution and culture, I'm completely with you. Uh, that, that's uh, so maybe related to culture. The, the difference I would make there is that maybe it's slightly related to here. You, you could think of societies as uh, having a role in shaping the way people uh, 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 form their categories. For example, societies or designers. Well, if I want to use a more uh, economic economic jargon could sort of uh, regulate the kind of aggregate statistics people have access to. So for example, it's not, it's a very common uh, regulatory idea to say that when you go to a banker who tells you about the performance of a fund, he would have to warn you uh, that you should not extrapolate. So maybe you shouldn't behave as um, my theory would suggest uh, people would do naturally that, that's based on aggregate statistics. I don't know, being exposed to the statistic that it's always more uh, uh, rewarding to invest in the stock market than in the housing market in the long run. Uh, so people may use this kind of uh, uh, wrong associations. Yeah. So it's, and there may be room for designers to intervene in that kind of, uh, of thing. Now, related to your sec the last question, which is, I think, I guess, also related to the early question you raised on the link to Nash of a different game. So, um, what can I say? If you have in mind uh, that we want to keep from Nash equilibrium the idea of best response, right, but of a different game. I'm not sure AB does that because it, it, well, if again, if you insist on a specific representation of the subjective word you face to, you can always do that. Uh, but uh, if you want to do it in a way that would not be uh, uh, equilibrium dependent, I don't think you can. I mean, this was the, the illustration of the... Another aspect in which I, I don't think uh, 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 this idea would... Be, what, what I'm doing is different from example, from a, 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 a related but different idea, which would be that you partition the states 
and you force your strategy to be measurable with respect to this uh, uh, new partition. This, of course, you can uh, 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 you can envision with just a change of the information. And, and that's what that's what I thought you were doing, actually. And I'm not doing that because okay. what I'm doing is that it's the belief. Uh, about the play of the other, which has this uh, uh, measurability structure. But your best response, for example, as we saw in this, well, it's a long time ago, but let me go back to this slide uh, here. So here, I was assuming players observe the game they are in, but to, to, in order to assess the strategy of the other player, they put the two games in the same analogy class. So they form an aggregate belief, the beta, about the play of the other player, but they, 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 they identify where they are. You can see that by the fact that they are not playing in the same way in the two games. They play A in one and B in two. So you cannot view what I'm doing as a coarsening of the, uh, 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 the information partition because it's on the belief space, if you wish. It's like, so what is common maybe with what you have in mind is the, the way you form your theory about the other player for, uh, uh, satisfies this requirement on the measurability of the opponent's strategy. But the true strategy of the other player need not satisfy this measurability. It's only in your mind, in your representation. Of course, there is a link between your subjective representation and what the other player is doing through the consistency. Does this go yeah. in the direction of... Yeah, I, I have to think about it. Yeah, thank you. But that's... So at the end, I think it's much closer in terms of solution concept. In fact, it's a special case to the self-confirming equilibrium. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a selection of it which, uh, in a way, had no status in the self-confirming -confirm equilibrium literature. Um, and it's a selection which is permitted, well, if you, if you, you, you accept this idea of simplicity AD, to a special kind of signals that I'm considering here. I'm not clear, so this is also an open question, whether for other feedback you may consider in the self-confirming uh, environment, whether you could define a similar notion of selection. I don't know. Um, yeah, thanks for the many questions. I mean, these are great. I mean, some of your questions are related, I suppose, to Wittgenstein uh, research agenda. So, um, so I, I, I hope I have an excuse not giving uh, complete satisfactory answer to that, but. <laughs> Are there uh, additional questions? Okay, so uh, thank you uh, very much, Philippe. Uh, and uh, see you all uh, in two weeks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.